All right, guys, thank you very much to everybody for joining me this afternoon. Um, my name is Gunnar Likens. I am a data engineering manager at FanDuel, responsible for the batch ingestion data platform team. Uh, so as you can see, today we will be talking about orchestrating and optimizing a batch ingestion data platform for America's number one sports book. Stepping into it, so just to give you guys an idea of what we're gonna be talking about today. So first, I'll give you guys a little bit of an overview for those that are not aware of what FanDuel is, um, some of the, the numbers of the company itself. Um, we'll get into how we create and manage our data pipelines. We'll then get into a little bit about our monitoring and troubleshooting setup that we have. Uh, we'll talk about some scaling and optimizing features that we have been working on, I would say, over the past two or three years. We'll then get into some future trends and considerations that we've been looking into, and then I'll conclude with just some wrap-ups, and then, of course, uh, we'll get into some Q&A thereafter. So let's jump right into it. Uh, first things first, introduction to FanDuel. Uh, so for those that are not aware, we are an innovative sports tech entertainment company. Uh, you can see there's a diverse portfolio that we do offer. It isn't just a sports book. Uh, there is more to it. Um, so there's sports betting, daily fantasy sports, TV, media, so on and so forth. Um, as far as our market presence goes, so we are operating in all 50 states. We serve approximately 17 million customers um, and have nearly 30 retail locations throughout the United States. Uh, as, as of 2023, so just some key stats to, to give some context and frame what we're working with, we were announced as the number one sports betting company in the U.S. We are also the fastest growing operator in iGaming, and we are the first US online operator to turn a full profit for a calendar year. Uh, so to give you guys an idea of the size of the company, we do have roughly about 4,000 employees. 1,600 of those are inside of technology, and then of those 1,600, about 100 of those are specifically in data engineering itself. So how did the batch ingestion data platform come to be what it is today here at FanDuel? Um, I would say that this really is kind of an 11, 12 year journey that we've been on. Um, and I'll kind of hit on some of the key areas along the way that we, we've gone through. So we'll go all the way back to 2013. Uh, this was the onset of when we had some of our batch ingestion data pipelines. We were just using Luigi. Um, this was sustainable for us at the time, given the size of volume of the data that we had, the number of production pipelines, this fit our needs. Um, fast forward probably about five years then, we got into our first iteration of what we called Eerie. Eerie at this point was the first time that we started using Airflow itself. And I think there's a couple key things that came out of what we were looking to go to with Eerie. Um, we knew from a scalability standpoint, Airflow was what made the most sense for us. This was also the first time that we adopted Python 3. Um, and I would say that the two other big ones were as far as data warehouse migrations go, we needed some way of enforcing consistency. So making it self-serve with using Alimbif migrations. And then we started to get into libraries, but you'll see quickly within a calendar year that that took a whole new turn. Um, so you'll hear me refer to this a lot, and I'll get into it on the coming slides, but we at FanDuel essentially refer to our batch ingestion data platform as Automata. Um, so Automata was first introduced in 2019, and the idea was to address the pitfalls of what we had instituted in 2018. Um, so with Automata, I would say the biggest thing was we found that we were lacking consistency. A lot of our data engineers themselves were just going off and actually writing their own Python DAGs. Um, so as a platform team itself, it became very unsustainable for us to try and measure consistency across all the different pipelines that were being performed. Um, so we needed some way of trying to make it so that code was more reusable. Um, and the biggest step that we took with that was going towards TOML files. Um, for those that are not aware, a TOML file is essentially just a one-off of a YAML file itself. This allowed for faster scalability for us, especially as the size of the company continued to grow. And it also made it so that way it was a lot easier for engineers to onboard um, and create pipelines themselves. I'll then jump forward about three years. We'll get into our V2 of Automata. Um, and this is kind of the big piece that I'll say where Astronomer came into the picture. Um, in 2022 was when we onboarded Astronomer as our vendor. Um, and really the biggest thing here that I would say is that the relationship has continued to grow and we'll get into some of those things that we've worked on with them. Um, but the biggest thing was for meeting internal SLAs. 
This allowed the engineers themselves to focus more on the data engineering tasks um, and allow somebody else, as an astronomer, to help with supporting our infra and networking from that standpoint. The last piece that I'll talk about is 2023. So this is our V3 of Automata. This one, there's a whole piece that I'll get into, but just to give everybody kind of a, a sneak peek of it, the biggest thing was we increased tremendously the size of pipelines within a calendar year. And so it just was not becoming sustainable just to have one airflow vertical deployment. So we started looking into what are some best practices for security, robustness, scalability, costs, all that good stuff. Uh, so that's really what brings us then to today. So with that being said, I'll give a little bit of a preview of what we are working with, the size of the data, all of that good stuff, the volume, and so on and so forth. So for those that are familiar with Astronomer, we do have three different workspaces that we currently work within. Within those three workspaces, we have 17 deployments on a monthly basis, and these numbers continue to grow month over month. But as of this past month, we are at just over 350,000 DAG runs and just over 3.6 million tasks that were executed on a monthly basis. So next into how we create and manage all of our data pipelines. So Automata, as I referred to on the, the timeline itself, essentially is just our internal name that we use for our batch ingestion data platform. Um, at FanDuel, within the data side of things, we love to just use all of the Greek mythologies. Um, so Automata is Greek for self-acting, self-willed, and self-living, which is Really kind of the objective and mission statement that we have behind our software that we are serving. The biggest thing for Automata itself is it serves as an orchestrator not only for data needs but also for product needs. So from a data standpoint, yes, we're able to ingest data from several different sources, perform transformations, land it in whatever we need for our downstream users to make use of it. On the product side of things, we are able to perform custom built self-serve steps um, that are needed and curtailed towards each of our users accordingly. Uh, from a data processing standpoint, I think this was the biggest thing that we don't have our delivery engineers who are interacting with our stakeholders on a day-to-day -day basis, having to worry about the underlying infrastructure behind data pipelines themselves. They're able to focus on more of those specific tasks and leave the platform to be the ones that are actually handling these type of things. So what has made it successful and what has allowed us to get to this 11, 12 year journey that I've talked about so far? Well, the biggest thing I would say is coming down to a self-serving aspect. Um, in essence, what we're trying to get to is to allow a delivery engineer to define what their delivery definition is. Where do I have data coming from? Where do I wanna write my data to? And from there, everything else will take care of itself. We'll be able to orchestrate our pipelines in a consistent manner. So this is really what it comes down to. We want to minimize that human interaction that's required. So that way, more and more business needs can continue to be focused on. So I'll get into really, I keep saying the delivery definitions or Toma files themselves. Here is a little sneak peek with the image on the right of what I'm referring to. So if I walk through this from the top, essentially what we start with is we ask all of our deli delivery engineers to define what their delivery type is. That delivery type will say from X to Y and the type of load that I want to perform. So from X to Y being from my source to my destination with those given there. So for example, JDBC, different file sources, Kafka, Redshift, SFTP, whatever it might be. Do I want to land data in a Delta Lake? Do I want to land it in Redshift, S3, so on and so forth? And depending on the size of the data that we're dealing with, do we want to do that in an incremental load or do we want to do that in a full load? So then we get down to, this gets into some of the pipeline descriptions themselves. Who are the owners? What is your schedule? We use a current scheduler just like we do for Airflow itself. Define what your time zone is. And then you can define your different attributes for your sources and destinations. The only other piece that I have not touched on here that you will notice is about three quarters of the way down, you'll see a section called steps. So the steps themselves are within our batch ingestion platform, we do have cleansing and light transformations that we are able to perform before we get to DBT. So some of those cleansing and light transformations, for example, might be time conversion, data type standardizations, permission settings, so on and so forth. Uh, so this is really kind of our bread and butter that I would say makes up all 1,200 plus existing production pipelines that we have. Um, 
and really has allowed us to, to create the streamlined manner that we proceed forward with. Of course, we can't actually make it so we serve all different cases that data might need. Uh, so yes, we want to make it self-serve, but this gets into what are those scenarios that we should be serving versus maybe not so much. So with that being said, we create for this 80-20 principle. Uh, the cliche one that is transferable in many different manners, but we'll talk about this one here with respect to what we have for our batch ingestion data platform. So yes, as I talked about on the previous slide, we do have from our source to our destination, depending on what the type of load is. But every once in a while, we will get some of our customers that say, you know what, our data doesn't really fit this exact mold or this template that you guys are asking for. What can we do to still serve our needs here? So this is where we get into how we are able to serve custom sources um, and themselves. So you'll see at the, the delivery definition type right there with the blue underlined, we will say custom to destination and then still incremental or for full load. And the users themselves are able to actually just put in whatever their custom arguments are. So you can think of, for example, in a SQL file, define what type of data you want to load to and where. Um, so this is the idea behind it. Yes, we're always gonna try and encourage our users to try and follow that format as much as we can. But if we have vendors that maybe it doesn't make much sense for, this is a type of area that we would refer them to for that 20%. So hitting home again on the idea of enforcing consistency here, um, I'll kind of tie this all back to two of the key software principles that we have. So single responsibility and the Unix philosophy. Um, so the whole idea is a data pipeline should have one and all. Uh, we get down to, we want to be able to make each pipeline do one thing well and be able to compose more complex pipelines from simpler ones. So I think this is really the epitome of what makes Automata successful for us. Code is reused on a module basis, um, and our generated code that we have through our CICD steps is tested once and able to be used many times, hence why we're able to scale at the size that we are. Jumping into the next section now, um, I'll talk about monitoring and alerting and what we also do for troubleshooting. So a lot of times we'll get customers when we're trying to onboard one into the, the data platform itself, and they might say, you know, why does it make sense for us to, to move or migrate our pipelines over to Automata? And I think this is kind of one of our key ones that we like to hit home on is within the data platform itself, all of our monitoring, alerting, and observability is embedded within it. So it doesn't allow the users or it doesn't force them to have to do any of that on their own. So with that being said, you can see some of the, the different softwares that are included here, but everything that we use is with Terraform infrastructure as code. We do have that integrated with Slack and PagerDuty as well. And then from a monitoring and alerting standpoint, we will use Datadog and Databand. On the coming slides, I'll get into more detail on each of these. All right, we'll start with Terraform. Uh, so for those that are not aware, I think the biggest one is infrastructure as code. Uh, we don't want people having to go in and make manual changes. From a traceability standpoint, it just makes it near impossible for anything of that sort to be able to scale. Uh, so the biggest thing with this is that you can version and reuse different configurations that you would have depending on whatever environment that you're working in. So for us at FanDuel, we use Terraform for just about everything for all of our compute resources that we would have for IAM permissions, all of that good stuff, as well as for Datadog on all of our monitors and dashboards, which gets into the next one. So Datadog itself from a, I always say alerting standpoint, we kind of separate this out into two different facades. We have the monitoring alerting for the platform team itself and the monitoring alerting for the pipeline owners, which in our case would be delivery engineers. So the first case is what I'll be talking about here, which will be for the platform itself. So for the team that I manage itself within all of our compute resource monitoring, that is all done through Datadog. So anything from our EMR to RDS, EKS, all of those different areas, this is where we're going to define those monitors. Uh, we do have Datadog that is integrated with PagerDuty as well as a, a specific Slack channel. So this allows it so that way 24-7, 365, depending on who is on-call support for our team, they will be able to see what alert is triggered from which deployment and the why to that case, why they were paged. Um, the next thing is that, again, with using Terraform for our Datadog monitors, I think the other nice thing about this is you can define what your thresholds are and they are adjustable. So a lot of times, especially, you know, for example, if we're gonna see that the number of production 
is going to increase, whether it's a new state that's going live, um, or we just see that we're, we're exploring a new business avenue, we might need to adjust what those thresholds were from a previous setup. The next thing I would say is that Datadog itself is fantastic for dashboards. Um, so for FanDuel itself, one of our biggest times of the year is the NFL season, um, and more particularly, especially around the Super Bowl. So I can specifically allude to this past year. I remember watching the Super Bowl, watching the Chiefs play, and just having up on my own screen just all of our EMR compute resources, making sure that everything was the way that it should. So we couldn't ask for an easier user interface on this, and I think that that's really is what allowed us to, to be successful from that point. And do the other one now for data itself. Um, yes, this is great that we're able to monitor all the compute resources and all of that good stuff, but the engineers that own the pipelines themselves, they may not necessarily care about what that EMR usage is or if you have airflow detection of a heartbeat down or anything of that sort. What they're going to be caring about is how are their pipelines specifically functioning. So to take care of that, we do utilize DataBand. This allows users to set up customized alerts on a per pipeline and per task basis. Just like we have within Datadog itself, all of these alerts also are integrated with PagerDuty as well as Slack. So they will also get alerts for any issues that arise. A lot of these alerts, just to give you guys an idea, there's some of them that are listed there. Um, but for example, pipeline run in state as well as task run in state, running success failure, those are some that are commonly defined for us. Um, we'll see schema changes, so if you add or remove a column, if you change type on a column, and then the last one that I would get into is custom task metrics. So DataBand itself utilizes an anomaly detection feature to detect anomalous behaviors that we would see. So there are quite a few that are, are defined for that as well. Next, this is probably the section that is near and dear to my heart the most is uh, I think where we spent a lot of our time over the past 12, 18 months is scaling and optimization. So I'll talk through a couple different use cases here, but if folks recall from the timeline that I showed, I think the biggest thing is in 2023 on our Automata V3 version, what we noticed is that we saw about a three times increase in the number of production pipelines that we were supporting over a calendar year. And this just was something that really begged the question of, are we set up in the best way that we can be for success going forward? So I like to call this our decoupling of our monolithic deployment. So as opposed to having hundreds or even thousand in our case of data pipelines productionized that were in one airflow deployment, what we did was we split this out on a per business vertical basis. And this had several benefits for us, which I'll get into on the next slide here. So as part of this, I think I can really boil this down to the three S's, security, stability, scalability. From a security standpoint, I think the greatest thing that we have was within Astronomer itself, you're able to restrict access to individuals on a needed basis. So for example, I'll just use some of our business verticals to give everybody an idea. We have marketing, commercial, casino, reporting, so on and so forth. The folks that are pipeline owners for reporting may not necessarily need to have access to those same production pipelines in marketing or casino. So on a per deployment basis, you can also get into a more granular level of access and permissions as well. From a stability standpoint, excuse me, I think the biggest thing was, like I said, as we saw that three times increase in the number of production pipelines, what really happened is for a platform team itself, if we were pushing pull requests to production and we saw that there might be an issue, if we had to revert, the blast radius that was impacted on that was quite significant versus now if we're able to localize what those changes are to a specific environment or a specific deployment, it reduces that, that issue of things going wrong or us missing SLAs. From a scalability standpoint as well, I'd say that there's enhanced government now that we're able to per deployment basis. So defining what are all our worker types, what's our concurrency that we have set up. Some of our deployments, for example, casino may only have 10 pipelines, marketing may have hundreds. So we don't need to have the same compute resources that are consuming on both of those. It can be more customized. And then last but not least, I'll, I'll save, of course, for those that are in the, these numbers, me, myself being the one, from a cost standpoint, we did notice that there was quite a bit of savings as well. So we saw about a 10K savings that just came month over month just from that simple decoupling of our monolithic deployment. The next one I'll get into, this was actually a, a project that my team led earlier 
Q1 of this year. So we had some of our HR and tax folks that had come to us and they said, hey, look, you know, we have a lot of sensitive PII data that there's several kind of specific encryption requirements that we need to, to work within here. We want to have some data pipelines that exist within Automata, but we have some, some concerns about how that might be set up. What can we do to maybe work with you guys to, to come up with a more customized solution? So you can see kind of within the drawing in the notes that I have here, uh, what we had to do was we set up a whole new different workspace. That workspace then again comes back to the same idea. It was on an as needed basis that only specific individuals would have access to turning pipelines on and off. And we also made it so that way the data remains encrypted throughout the whole entire process, even when it's copied to Redshift by using a separate compute cluster for that. So that was another example that we kind of worked with earlier this year to really show that regardless of the requirements that might be coming this way, we do want to try and make it so that way it is self-serving and meets the customer's needs. And last but not least, probably our most recent one. So really, obviously I've kind of been alluding a lot to production, but I would be doing it injustice if I only talked about that. We do have a development area, we do have a pre-production area that we're working within. And a lot of times that is where we're devoting quite a bit of energy as well, is to try and enhance that developer experience at a lower level environment. For a multitude of reasons, some of them to mention, have customers build their confidence so that way when they implore changes to production, they will be successful. And then it also allows it so that way time to release on new features is sustainable and scalable in the future. So one of the big ones that we did was actually last quarter. We tried to make it so that way our setup that we had from an infrastructure and networking standpoint was the same on our lower level environments as what we saw in production. And so what this really came down to is now Developers are able to spin up their own Airflow deployments for testing out pull requests specific to whatever the changes are that are in their PR. So if you look at the screenshot here, you'll see, for example, the PR number from GitHub was 5271, or 5721, excuse me. And the only pipelines that they would see there would be the changes that are relevant to their pipeline. So for us, this was a tremendous step in the right direction as opposed to having separate infrastructure, separate networking that you were using for your development testing because then it came down to an apples and oranges comparison on what you were testing in development before release into production. So how we're able to make sure that this is scalable as well, this is a little predated now, but we did have just a maintenance tag that would go through and delete deployments based off of if they were eight hours or older. So for example, just within a working day, we have now since migrated to a hosted version, Astronomer, and within that hosted version of Astronomer, we were able to just hibernate schedules off of whatever schedules that you set. So we no longer have to do this manually. It is part of the product feature that we have within Astronomer itself, which is fantastic. All right, so we'll get into future trends and considerations. Where are we headed in the future, 2025 and beyond? So a lot of this is what I've been talking about is just orchestrating jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. But ultimately, what this really boils down to is any orchestrated or scheduled jobs should be able to come to our data platform and meet their needs. So some of the ones that we do have in mind is we have a couple teams that want to try and take some of their scheduled logging that would come out of build kite, try and use that for some business analytics and extrapolating some insights from that. A couple others are automating process that we have right now. Um, so I have the one that's listed for, for tax purposes, um, depending on identifying future trends and considerations around what those transactions are performed. We're also doing the same thing for regulatory reporting. When we work with regulators, anytime that we regenerate reports, we want to have to automate that as much as we can. And then the last one would be, so we have some iOS game files, um, and we want to automate how those are delivered to the iOS app store for those delivery teams. And last but not least, let's come back and hit on what are the key principles that we've covered here for Automata itself. So if there's nothing else that you take away from this, it would be this slide here. So self-service. Within Automat itself at FanDuel, we want any and every user to interact in, in an easy manner by creating digestible TOML files. We don't want users, if there's little or no previous Python knowledge, they shouldn't be scared or deterred away from actually being able to interact with our platform. Standardization, so I hit on this one, but if you recall, we want to enhance the reliability and maintainability of a team that we have 
within platform itself to ensure that SLAs are met and that teams can continue to do things in a standardized way. Scalability, so we're always on the hunt for this one. I think some of the folks that I've worked closely with at Astronomer would be able to test to this one, but anything that we can do for performance improvements or cost, off, cost reductions by continuing to descale what we have on our workspaces and deployments is a big one that, that's always at the forefront of our minds. Observability, so yes, we want to make sure that observability is present. We want all engineers to feel like their pipelines are being uh, sufficiently monitored. There is the robustness around those at whatever granular level that you want to look at. And then last but not least, I'll go to the orchestration diversity. Yes, this is all about serving whatever data engineering needs that need to be met, but truthfully, we should be able to orchestrate things beyond just data engineering. And I think this is kind of at the forefront of our business minds that we have right now, working with stakeholders and figuring out within FanDuel itself where can we continue to grow as well. So thank you very much.